Okay, so this is going to be the first video for chapter 17. Chapter 17 has over 150 slides, so I'm going to be breaking it up according to census. So this one will be introduction all the way through gustation or taste. I'm going to skip over the learning outcomes. You guys can read those. So this entire chapter is the special census. Now, what makes them special? What makes them special is that they are all of the receptors for these senses are gathered into special sense organs. So unlike receptors for touch or pressure or temperature or pain, which are scattered all over your body, the ones for the special senses, we gather all of the receptors together and put them into a special sense organ. So for sight, we put them in the retina of the eye. For the uh, hearing and balance, we put them in the ear and so on. Okay, so the special senses include olfaction, which means smell. Obviously, that happens in the nose. Gustation or taste, that happens in the mouth. Vision in the eye. Equilibrium, which is balance in the ear and hearing in the ear. So those are your special senses. So we're going to start out with smell. Smell and taste are going to be the focus of this video. Now, both smell and taste are what we call chemical senses. So we're going to be using chemoreceptors in order to pick up particular molecules. And a really important part of this is they have to be dissolved in a fluid. Okay, so the organs for olfaction are up inside your nasal cavity at, on either side of the nasal septum, and there are two layers that make up the olfactory organs. We have the olfactory epithelium, and we have the lamina propria. The olfactory epithelium has the sensory neurons that are going to actually pick up the different chemicals. These are highly modified nerve cells that act as they're the dendritic ends, and they were going to be generating our action potential that's going to go to our brain and tell us what we're smelling. There are supporting cells around the sensory neurons, and then there are stem cells called basal epithelial cells that are there to help replenish lost cells. Now, underneath the olfactory epithelium, we have the lamina propria, which is made of areolar tissue. Remember that from the connective tissues of anatomy one. We're going to have blood vessels and nerves. And because we have to have our chemical dissolved in a fluid, the fluid of choice in the nose is known as mucus. Now, mucus comes from mucin that's produced by glands mixing with water. And the water is going to come from your eyes, from your tear ducts. And so we're going to have extra mucin glands called olfactory glands to make sure that we have enough mucus up inside the nasal cavity in order to be able to smell things. So here's a diagram. So we have the olfactory bulb, which is the enlarged end of cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve. And then it sends out these roots through the cribriform plate of the sphenoid bone. And then it branches into rootlets. Now these are going to be where we're going to find our olfactory epithelium. Okay. So actually the air is going to come in your nose, it's going to travel through these different passageways, and then it's going to come into contact with mucus that's on the surface of the olfactory sensory neurons, and the dissolved chemicals that end up in the mucus are going to be picked up by these receptors. So here's a close-up of the olfactory receptor. So you see here's one of the olfactory glands making extra mucus. Here is our lamina propria up against the cribriform plate of the sphenoid bone. Excuse me, I'm sorry, ethmoid bone. Oh my gosh, Dr. Wallace needs another cup of coffee. The ethmoid bone. And then we have the blue ones here are our olfactory sensory neurons. And the pink ones are our supporting cells in the epithelium. And then notice the ending of the olfactory sensory neuron are dendrites. And this is where we're going to have the receptor parts. So the stuff being smelled has to get into the mucus surrounding these dendrites, and then it can be applied to the receptors. So we call the chemical that's going to be smelled the odorant, and the odorant in the mucus locates a G-protein coupled receptor, and this is going to open local ion channels and create a generator potential. This kind of should sound familiar. Now, if we get enough generator potential to cross threshold, then of course we're going to get an action potential, and it's the action potential that can be passed all the way through the olfactory nerve up into the brain to be interpreted. So, we have afferent fibers that leave the olfactory epithelium. This will be the axons of those olfactory neurons. They collect into bundles of 20 or more. 
they go through the cribriform plate and then they reach the olfactory bulb and they synapse with the olfactory bulb neurons. Then the second neuron leaves the olfactory bulb and goes to the olfactory cortex, the hypothalamus and the limbic system. Now this is important. Smell is the only sense that does not get filtered through the thalamus. And so the thalamus does not shut off smell. Now smell does adapt, but it does not go to the thalamus. Instead it goes to the hypothalamus because that's where your appetite is controlled. And it goes interestingly to the limbic system, which is your emotional center. So smell triggers emotions. Isn't that interesting? So if you think about like, if you smell peppermint, you might think of Christmas. If you smell baby powder, you might think of your little baby or little babies you know. Or if you get a package from a distant relative like your mom and you open up the package and she sends you something and you can smell your mom's smell, it triggers emotions. Okay, all of our other senses have to go through the thalamus and therefore they kind of get filtered away from the emotional system. Okay, so this is a nice graphic that tells you all of the steps in olfaction. All right, everything from the stimulus to the dendrites, okay, all of that. Now, this also has gustation, which is taste, on the same graphic, and that's what we're going to talk about next, okay? But this is, again, going second page of the graphic, going through the individual steps. Okay, so we can distinguish thousands of different smells, but dogs are even better than us. They have 72 times more olfactory receptors. Thus, they can smell 10,000 times better than we can. And as you get older, your receptors start to die off faster and, and you get a less sensitive sense of smell the older you get. Okay, gustation or taste is also a chemical sense. The, the fluid of choice that we're going to use to apply the tastant is going to be saliva. So we use mucus in the nose, we use saliva in the mouth. We're going to have gustatory epithelial cells where we're gonna, these are gonna be our taste receptors. And they're going to be found in this thing called a taste bud. Now, if I asked you right now to point at a taste bud, most of you would point at the little bumps on your tongue. And unfortunately, you would be incorrect. The bumps are called lingual papillae. And the taste buds are down the sides of the bumps. That way, when you put something in your mouth and it dissolves in your saliva, gravity takes it down into the cracks between the bumps. And that's where it's going to contact the taste receptor. Okay? So lingual papillae are those bumps on the surface of the tongue. And the taste buds and taste receptors are down the sides. So those little bumps, we have them in four different shapes. Filiform are kind of like a flame shape, and they actually have no taste buds associated with them. They're covering the surface of your tongue, and they're there to actually hold on to your food and move it around in your mouth. Okay, so a lot of those bumps on your tongue don't taste anything. Then we have fungiform. Now, as you can imagine, they kind of shape like mushrooms. The fungiform are scattered between the filiform. And these do have taste buds, actually about five taste buds each down the sides of the fungiform papillae. Remember, they're not on the top, they're on the, the bottom edges, the sides of the little sticking out parts. And then we have valate. Some texts will call these circumvalate papillae. These are huge circular disc shapes that are on the back of the tongue in the shape of a V. And these are the largest ones, and they have as many as 100 taste buds each. And then down the sides of the back of your tongue, you have these gill-shaped ones, or foliate papillae. And these also have taste buds. These kind of look like leaves. So the taste buds are going to be on the sides of the different papillae other than filiform. Remember, filiform has no taste buds. And we're going to also have basal epithelial cells or stem cells for replacing both the papillae cells and the taste buds. Now, coming out of the gustatory epithelial cell are going to be microvilli that are called taste hairs, and they extend through a little hole called a taste pore. So listen to that. You've got a hairy tongue. Each of these only survive about 10 days before they have to be replaced. So your taste receptors are replaced about every 10 days by stem cells. 
Now, the cranial nerves that are going to go into the solitary nucleus of the medulla are where we're going to get our sense of taste, and it goes to the thalamus, and then the gustatory cortex, where you actually interpret food taste, is in the insula lobe. So it would be on that thin layer of gray matter on that interior brain lobe. So here is a diagram of your tongue. Okay, now filiform and fungiform are all these random dots, and I can't tell from this distance which one is which. These little, like, leaf, like if you look down the vein of a leaf, I kind of think they look like fish gills. These are your filiform papillae down the two sides, and then these are your vallate. So, filiform, fungiform, foliate, and vallate. Now, I can tell you some funny things. Filiform has no taste buds. Fungiform picks up salty and sweet, and there's a lot of them here on the tip of your tongue. These foliate are really good at picking up sour or sour flavors. So if you ever bite into something sour, you might feel these kind of react a little bit. And then these ones, the lovely valate, are the guardians of your body. These are extra super sensitive to bitter flavor. And they're arranged at the very back of your tongue at the point of no return for swallowing. This is there for a really important reason. Most things that are poisonous to our bodies taste bitter. And so if we're eating something that has a bitter chemical in it, your body assumes it's poisonous. It hits these valate receptors and causes the gag reflex. This is trying to protect you. So why am I telling you this? If you're a parent and you have small children and you're trying to get your kids to eat something like, I don't know, broccoli, and they're sitting at the table and they're going, Kah! and it sounds like they're dying, believe me, their body thinks you're trying to poison them. Their little taste receptors are saying, no way, this stuff is going to kill me. I cannot swallow it. So cut them a little bit of slack, okay? Don't make them eat all of the broccoli. It's really, their brain is telling them it's really poisonous. Okay, that was for fun. All right, so here are what those papillae look like. So here are the filiform. Notice they look, kind of look like flames, and there are no taste buds down the sides. The fungiform kind of around it like the top of a mushroom. And then down in these crevices are where we're going to find our taste buds. Foliate, the ones on the sides, also have these deep cracks between them. And you'll see these are where the taste buds are located. And then here is the huge valate ones with lots, up to 100 taste buds associated, man, mainly for bitter flavors. And here is a photo micrograph of the actual taste bud. Okay, if you were to look really close with an even better microscope, you would notice the little hairs that are sticking out, the microvilli, called the taste hairs, through the hole that does the taste pour. And then we have different transitional cells and some gustatory cells here. So just like in the nose, we have the chemical that's going to be detected. It gets dissolved this time in saliva. It would go down. We go back a slide. The saliva would drive it down into these cracks and apply it to the taste hairs. The taste hairs are where we have the receptors. And so different taste dents will open different ion channels and cause some G protein coupled receptors to create generator potentials. So there are four primary taste sensations that we can detect. Sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And I just kind of gave you a general idea where they're located. Now you also have taste receptors in your cheeks and on your gums and in the roof of your mouth. So it's not only on your tongue. And so a lot of people argue you shouldn't really say that, you know, sweet and salty are at the tip of the tongue. I'm just saying there are a lot of receptors for them there. Not only there, but a lot of them there. Okay? We also have an additional taste that we can pick up called umami. Now, umami is a Japanese word for deliciousness. Now, these are primarily glutamate receptors, and they are looking for glutamic acid, which is one of the amino acids that's heavily pre prevalent in fatty foods. So it's a richness detector. So it's kind of like the difference between eating a chicken breast or eating a ribeye steak. They have a different depth of flavor, and that depth of flavor is known as umami. Now, since it is a glutamate receptor, there are, a long time ago, somebody discovered that there is this chemical that they could add to your food called monosodium 
glutamate or MSG that stimulated these receptors. And so if you put that on the food, it enhanced the flavor of the food and gave it a richness that made it seem more delicious. And so that's when MSG started being added to certain foods. We also have water receptors. Have you ever noticed water has a taste? And depending on whether it's mineral water or tap water or well water, you can taste differences. And so there are water receptors in the pharynx, which is the back of the throat, and also where we have our thirst centers. Okay, now taste sensitivity is different amongst different people. Sometimes it's genetic. There is actually a chemical called PTC or phenylthiocarbamide that you are genetically able to taste it or not. Now, when I teach general biology, I do a lab where I have a piece of paper that has this on it and I get my camera ready because everybody puts the paper on their tongue at the same time and about 50% of the class starts gagging because it tastes terrible to them. And the other 50% of the class is going, what's wrong with you? I, just, I don't taste anything. I am lucky I can't taste it. So I have no idea what they're going through, but it is kind of funny to watch. All right. Um, also, different conditions can change your perception of taste. So temperature of the food. Notice hot fried chicken tastes really yummy, right? Cold fried chicken tastes really yummy, but they don't taste the same even though it's the same food. Texture can affect how something tastes to you. Some people don't like things based on how they feel in their mouths. And sometimes it's a food that you like, but if your brain is set up for one food that you like and you're presented with another food that you like, it may come off as not liking it. You're like, what are you talking about, Dr. Wallace? Well, here's an example. What if I handed you a beautiful vanilla ice cream cone with a beautiful scoop of vanilla ice cream right on top and you put it up to your mouth and you licked it and it was mashed potatoes. You like mashed potatoes, but when your brain was ready for cold, sweet vanilla ice cream, and instead it comes into contact with warm, salty, starchy potato, your initial reaction is yuck. Okay, so, so it's very situational what tastes we can like and dislike, and our tastes change over time. As children, we really like sweet and sour. As we get older, we start to really like bitter. So coffee and stout beers and you know dark chocolate. Oh my gosh, don't give my seven-year-old daughter a piece of dark chocolate. She thinks it's torture, but I love dark, dark chocolate. So as we get older, our taste preferences change over time. We also like more sophisticated combinations as we get older. So we like our sweet with our salty, or we like dark and bitter with a little sweet. Unfortunately, the number of taste receptors begins declining by age 50. So after 50, you taste less and less of what you're eating. So again, here's another graphic showing you generating a potential, action potentials, and then they're going to travel up to the gustatory cortex in the insula. Okay, so that is our first video for Chapter 17. Stay tuned for more.